goodness, it's only preseason, but I'm hyped he'll fuck. Jimmy G buckets, gets buckets. Oh my goodness, give me the hot sauce, Bill fuck. Give me the hot sauce. What are you doing, Dragic? Did you not get the memo? Welcome into a brand new edition of the Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the three separate boxes. We're all in different locations. If you're listening on Odyssey or your favorite podcast carrier, let me tell you where we are. I'm at home. Stacy's in Los Angeles getting ready for the Bulls-Lakers game on Thursday night. And Timmy Whispers is in the Sriracha studio. Stacy, you said the weather is not uh, real warm out in Los Angeles. Have you had a chance to get outside and do anything fun? Yeah, now we're we're staying up in uh, Beverly Hills, and um, you know any 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 weather here in Los Angeles is better than Chicago right now. So it's like in the sixties, a little chilly. Um, so getting ready after I do the podcast, heading out to Chino Hills, see if I can run into Levar uh, Ball out there in Chino Hills, a big baller. So no, I'm going out to dinner with some friends out there. So. <laughs> we we'll have to get the big baller back on the show. That was one of our best episodes. Like he was really entertaining. Yeah, I figure since we're out in Chino, everybody should know where he lives. They just point me to his house. <laughs> so I'm just going to show up at the door and knock on the door. <laughs> so, Whispers, what's going on with you? Anything happening this week? Well, welcome to the Timmy Whispers show. I'm here all by myself. So. <laughs> well, you got D and Cisco with you, right? Yeah, that doesn't help at all. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you don't, don't, give me you don't faces, have any surprise. Guys. You don't have any angry fans or some other surprises, some some drunk person walking by to come on the show today? No, they're they're even fighting the weather. I couldn't get them through the snow. <laughs> right. Well, Stacey, obviously this is a, an extended road trip, three games, but over stretched out over a span of seven days, a couple off days in between. And when you lose a heartbreaker like the Bulls did in Phoenix the other night, it makes the, that time go by rather slowly until you get another shot, doesn't it? Yeah, that was a tough loss. I mean, they they, they did everything so well uh, in the first half. Got a twenty three point lead, uh, and then right when that right when Caruso got his uh, fourth personal foul in the third quarter, that's when the wheels started falling out. You know, and um, you know, we all know how important Alex is to this team defensively. You know, uh, but whenever he goes out of games for long stretches, Mark, uh, the team just all of a sudden the offense stops moving. Uh, the little things that, that give you the winning plays in the game are, are no longer there. And uh, and their defensively, they're not the same team. So he's definitely got to stay out of foul trouble because uh, that really hurt the Bulls in the second half against the Suns. Yeah, and Phoenix in that situation, they had played on Sunday. So it was a back-to-back game situation. And it looked like the Suns came out sleepwalking. I think Durant was something like four for 15 in the first half, and he was missing shots that he normally makes. It looked like, you know, if you just get off to a good start in that third quarter, you could have pushed him over the edge. But once Durant got hot, they had no answers for him. No, I mean, you know, he's a guy that's going to take a lot of shots, and um, he's going to make a lot of shots. And he missed a lot of shots in the first half. Um, You know, I thought Alex did a great job on him. Um, I thought he got going when Patrick Williams was on him. You know, when Patrick Williams started guarding him, I felt like Patrick was giving him way too much respect, you know, uh, wasn't attacking him defensively like we've seen Patrick do other players. Uh, you know, Kevin Durant was able to get by, you know, one or two dribbles, raise up, mid-range game, get to get pretty much wherever he wanted to go on the floor when Patrick was guarding. So I would have loved to see Patrick draw a line in the sand and say, enough's enough. Let me buckle down now. My team needs me and get those stops. On the positive side, we saw another incredible game from Kobe White. I saw us a uh, tweet the next day saying that he had numbers when you go over a number of statistical categories that no one's ever done in the history of the NBA, which included shooting 70% from the field and 70% from the three point line. He's also mastered that stop and go move. Stacy. He's just catching guys with that on every game. Well, he's, he's got that. He's got that hesitation uh, dribbled down to a pack. Now he's really worked on his ball handling. Um, he's got confidence in his ball handling. He, he feels he can get by anybody. Uh, once he turn once he turns the corner and gets downhill below the free throw line, he pretty much can get where he wants. Um, you know, he he's trying to get his teammates involved. A lot of times he he can get a layup, Mark, but he'll kick it out to a three point shot. I'd like to see him score that. You know, if you work that hard to get downhill and get to the rim, finish it. 
the games before that, since we had our last show, uh, they beat the Raptors and the Grizzlies. It, it looks like this team is playing consistent basketball, but it's a question of can they continue that and move out of that play-in situation? What do you think the prospects are of continuing this stretch and maybe trying to make a run for the number six seed? Well, they got to they gotta learn how to finish games. You know, they can't allow games to slip by. When you got a team down, you got to be able to finish that team. You know, you're up 23. You got to be up 33 when the game's over. You got to make the other team quit. Um, I don't think teams, re- you know, I think teams realize like, hey, if you just stay the course and, and cut your turnovers down, you know, they'll let you back in the game. You know, there's been a lot of that, you know, this year where they've given up big leads and you want to know well, how in the hell did they lose? They were in control the whole game, you know, three and a half quarters, but not knowing how to finish games is a big problem for them right now, you know, because I think they're trying to establish who the go-to guy is, um, you know, so I think that's got to be, that's got to be worked out. If you're Billy Donovan, you gotta, you gotta, I feel like you gotta trust Kobe more to be a closeout guy too, you know, give him some opportunities because he's shooting the ball so well uh, from the three-point line and he's getting to the basket, scoring it, you know, over taller guys. Um, I think you got to, I think you got to look to give him the ball sometimes in clutch moments and see what he can do. Yeah. Going back to that Phoenix game, there was the one controversial call late where DeMar DeRozan made the basket, thought he was going to the free throw line for a three-point play. And then the Suns challenged it. It was an offensive foul. And granted, they made the right call. He did pull Grayson Allen's arm down. And I guess by the letter of the law, you can't give any points after an offensive foul. But it really seemed like that was after the shot. To me, it looked like that should have been a loose ball foul and count the basket. Yeah. Uh, the officials left a lot to be desired in that game. Um, I can't say that I was really excited about the way that the game was officiated. I thought in the first half, what kept Phoenix in the game was free throws. You know, there's a big free throw description in the first half with the Bulls. I mean, I think they had like 13 to two advantage and um, that kept them in the game. Even though the Bulls were blowing them out, it kept them in the game, kept them in striking distance. And with those three guys, they're such explosive scores, Mark, that even being down 23 means nothing because they can get hot from the three point line and get themselves right back in the game. I thought the technical on uh, Drummond fired up Phoenix, Eubanks, you know, he went crazy after right. that. Um, so there's, I mean, you can look at a lot of things in that game and come up with why the reason why you think they might've lost. Yeah. I'll tell you what, the, the quality of the officiating in the NBA leaves a lot to be desired. Did you see the other day? I think it was the Hornets Timberwolves. The last two minute report had 10 mistakes in the last two minutes. I mean, how can that officiating crew keep doing their jobs if they make 10 mistakes in two minutes? Well, the, the problem is, is that they need to start bringing two veteran officials and one young official instead of having two young officials and one veteran. Because when you bring two young officials, those, those officials are making a lot of mistakes in the game. Okay, they are. They just just be real. Uh, also, they're giving people texts when they shouldn't be giving people texts um, because they have rabbit ears. So I think the NBA needs to go back and start instituting two veterans, one, you know, one new person, and let that person learn from the veteran players, the veteran officials. The one home game in this stretch was uh, Saturday against the Memphis Grizzlies. And I know that you and Adam had a chance to have Joe Keem on the broadcast and Derek Rose was in the building. What was it like uh, catching up with those two guys? Well, it was really good talking to Joe. Joe's one of my favorite players, very personable. You know, he, he, uh, you know, he bleeds bulls, you know, uh, especially off the port. Some of the things he does off the port, uh, you know, is legendary, you know, I mean, he really gets into the community, backs up what he says. Um, and he's still active in the community, even though he's not with the Bulls, you know, in a player standpoint. You know, he's played for other teams. He's still, you know, actively doing his uh, Noah's Ark Foundation. And, um, you know, they just, I mean, just a good kid, you know, and having him on the having him on the show uh, in the third quarter and listening to some of his stories, his perspective on how things were, you know, during, you know, their heyday, you know, and how close they actually were to beating Cleveland and getting to the finals that year. You know, just interesting to hear his point of view. So uh, we had a lot of fun with him, a lot of fun. Yeah, he mentioned during that interview that he was uh, the officiant for uh, Derek Rose's wedding over the summer, and Joe admitted that he was nervous. Derek has, what, two or three kids now? You think that Derek might call it a career at the end of the season? He's obviously hurt again and not playing. I'm not sure what his contract situation is with Memphis, but, um, you know, obviously I know a lot of Bulls fans would like to see him play his last game in a Bulls uniform, but what's your what's your take? 
on, on Derek's basketball future? Um, I think he's going to play until he feels like he honestly can't play anymore. I think, um, you know, I think he's, he's had some bad luck with these muscular injuries, these tissue injuries, the hamstrings and stuff like that. But I think he can still play. I think he can still play uh, and be, you know, a good, you know, role player coming off the bench. And some nights turns back the clock and looks like the old D Rose. You know, uh, he still can. He can still go from ninety four feet. He's still one of the fastest guards out there. Um, he's still explosive. You know, so unless the game's no longer fun for him, I don't see that. I don't see him going anywhere. We mentioned the Bulls uh, beat the Raptors last Thursday. That was the night we taped our last episode. What do you think of the new look Raptors with Barrett and Quickly? You think they're going to fade, or do you think they're still in contention for a playing spot? <clears throat> well, I like the pickups, but I, I don't think they're going to be a threat for the playoffs. I think, you know, they 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 need to make another move and to strengthen their roster. Um, you know, you lose Siakam. Siakam's like losing three players. You know, um, just a just a a beast. And you lose that, you lose OG uh, Adenobi, and you saw the impact he's done with the Knicks. I mean, the Knicks are, you know, a very good defensive team, but they're a great defensive team with him. So, you know, it's 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 really sad, you know, because Toronto could have made the playoffs with the guys they had, you know, but I think they came to a point like, hey, you know what, realistically, are we going to win a title? If not, let's try to get something for these guys before they reach past their prime or before they get hurt and their trade value is down, and we have to keep them. Obviously, uh, the NBA trade market is starting to heat up. We're just over two weeks away from the deadline, which comes up on February 8th. Seems like there's really no market for Zach Levine. I mean, Casey Johnson told us as much when we had him on last week. But I know there's interest in Caruso and DeRozan, and it seems like Andre Drummond is picking up interest. You know, a lot of teams are looking for a backup big for the playoffs. Stacy, you think that AK will make some moves between now and February 8th? You know what? It's AK plays everything close to the vest, Mark. You don't know what he's thinking. You don't know what the the course of action is going to be. Um, I know he wants to win. I know he's not interested in, in uh, rebuilding completely. I think he, you know, he wants to keep a team that's still competitive. They could, could you know, quick turnaround. Um, but you know, how, how do you do that? How do you keep that? You know, you got you've got assets. You got Alice Caruso. I saw today. There's a report that the Bulls would want like two first rounders for him, you know? And I hear a lot of people going, really? Alex Caruso? But you, they don't know what they're getting. You know, you're getting a premier defensive stopper. Imagine if Milwaukee had him right now. Oh, yeah, right. I mean, their, their team would be their team would be a top, top team in the Eastern Conference just off his, what he brings defensively, you know, a lockdown defender. That's one of the areas, that's the reason why, you know, Milwaukee imploded because, you know, you traded offense, defense for offense. And now yeah, you know, we'll you, you re, now you see how much, you know, how important it is to have a guards or wings that can shut other guards or wings down because it can neutralize a team, take you completely out of your sets. You have to find someone else on the go, which you haven't prepared for. And that other person has to step up and play. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's difficult. Yeah, we'll talk about the whole Milwaukee shakeup in just a second. But before we get off the Bulls, we've been talking about Alex Caruso, Stacy, and he was named uh, one of 41 players that are in the pool to be selected to play for the U.S. national team at the Paris Olympics. Interesting that Zach, of course, who was part of that team last year, four years ago or five years ago, whatever it was, um, not part of the pool. DeRozan's not part of the pool, but AC is. I guess that shows what respect there is for him league-wide. Well, I mean, I think they realize that defense wins games and you got to have everybody can't come on the team playing offense. You got to have some good role players, a guy that's going to come out there, hit open three point shots. He's going to defend the toughest person every single time. Um, you can plug him anywhere in your offense and he's going to produce, you know, one, two, three or four, you know. And so uh, I think his confidence is sky high. I think he re he re I don't know how to feel make it because I mean, they're, they always go for the the star players, you know, the star mm -hmm. player. I don't know if he'll make it, but he would deserve to make it based off of his, his play and production. Well, before we talk about some league issues, I want to tell you about one of our great sponsors, our buddy Jeff Bukovic. If you want to be treated like royalty when it comes to insurance for your auto home and business, make sure you contact nationwide agent Jeff Bukovic. You can reach him at jeffbuk.com. That's jeffbuk.com. The phone number 847 
1-855-475-4783. Stacy, how are the Golden Pipes doing this afternoon? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> Nationwide <laughs> is on your side. Ah, the home of the Grammy Awards. And Stacy's in good form this afternoon <laughs> out in L.A. Hey, Whispers, so we haven't heard from you in a while. You got a question for uh, Stacy or some kind of made-up trade you think the Bulls should be interested in? Well, I'm just looking at his room there, and it looks pretty posh. Um, he's living that Beverly <laughs> Hills lifestyle. <laughs> look, at, look at that yeah. LED lighting and yeah. the curved, fabulous curtains. And uh, Yeah, looks- you got a piano in there, too? Yeah, and he's got his white sweater on. <laughs> Listen, it's, this, is the, this is the famed Beverly, uh, Beverly Hills uh, Wilshire Hotel, where the stars used to stay. And uh, that's like old Hollywood, you know, the old Hollywood people always want, they, they film Pretty Woman here. Uh, it's a real nice hotel, man. It's right next to Rodale Drive. You take two steps over, you're on Rodale Drive, you know, and, uh, you know, you, you get caught walking on there, man. They, first thing they ask you, excuse me, uh, how much money do you have? And you'd be like, oh, <laughs> why? You need to make sure you can walk on Rodale Drive. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the per diem comes up a little bit light on this trip, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, good restaurants. We went out to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles yesterday. And um, had a nice time out there with my friends. Get an In-N-Out burger? No, not yet. I had a fat burger the first day. And uh, the the new burger out here is called Herbs. Herbs is a new burger, man. That's a, that's like the best burger out here in uh, L.A. right now. Better nice. than In-N-Out. Nice. All right, let, let, let's uh, get to some of the league issues. We kind of teased it a little bit earlier. The whole shakeup in Milwaukee. Adrian Griffin is out despite a 30-13 oh. record. And Doc Rivers comes out of the broadcast booth with ESPN and ABC to take over as head coach. I love Doc. He's, he's a great guy, great to talk to. But his record in the playoffs, not so good, other than the one championship in Boston. I don't know how they expect Doc to come in there and wave a magic wand, and all of a sudden these guys who aren't playing defense are going to play defense. What, what's your take, Stacey? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's really terrible what they did to Adrian Griffin. I mean, Here's a guy that interviewed for the you know last 14 or 15 years. You know he's interviewed 14 times, and on the 15th time he finally gets his head coaching job. He's paid his dues. You know he played in this league. He was an assistant for the longest. He assistant for the Bulls, um, and he paid his dues. You know it was his turn, and you know to fire him. You know 30, you know 41 or two games into it, uh, the guy's got a 30 and 13 record, second in the Eastern Conference. 19 and four at home. They're almost unbeatable in Milwaukee. Um, And then you decide to make that move now, you know, because your star players, from what I heard was he he asked his star players to sacrifice the scoring part of it and play better defense, you know? And, uh, and I also, I think I also heard that, um, you know, they were trying to, you know, either wave Thanos, uh, the Giannis's brother. Right. Yeah. And that, was, that wasn't going to happen. It's, <laughs> Because he felt like they felt like they could use that roster spot by going out going to get someone that can play defense, you know. And so now they take they take you know take for granted, you know, losing guys like PJ Tucker, you know, Grayson Allen, you know, you you lose those guys on those on your team, and you start. And Drew Holiday has been a huge loss. I mean, that that's been felt more than any of the other losses, you know. So. When you lose a guy like Drew Holiday at the t- at the top of your at the top of your defense, who can take away the guard play, uh, you know, and Dame Dame has never been a defensive stopper ever. You would never put defense next to uh, next to his name at all. You know, he's a straight offensive killer, uh, big time shot maker, but you would never you know, tag he's a defensive stopper because he's not. Now maybe he's never been asked to play defense. You know. Maybe he can play defense. He's just he's going to have to be coaxed into it. But they're not going to get anywhere if they can't stop people. You know, if you can't stop people, I, I guess when Giannis and um, and Brooke Lopez were on the floor together, they're a top five defense. So if you know that analytically, why are you not playing that combination more? You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. The problem is that Lopez at 35 can't play major minutes anymore. Well, I, I, I try to neutralize him. I try to utilize him as much as I can, uh, you know, 20, 25 minutes a game, you know, and uh, take my chances. I mean, if, they, if, if, the, if the stats say that you're, you're a thousand times better than what you are when you have the other lineup out there and you're good with Brooke Lopez out there, why are you not playing him? And, you know, and 
Sorry, Mark. I was going to say, Stephen A says, this is it. This is it for, uh, for Doc. If he doesn't produce here, he'll never coach again. That's a really strong yeah. statement. Yeah. Well, hey, Stephen A knows. Uh, that's a really strong statement <laughs> because I don't, I don't think, I don't think he's on a, a win now, make it or break it type situation. I mean, you're being brought into a tough situation in the, almost in the middle of the year. Okay. You're, you're asked to try to take this team and make them a better defensive team and try to get them out of second round. The problem with, with, uh, with uh, Doc is he has a hard time getting out of second round. He, he, I mean, his record is, his record is crazy in second round defeats. So, you know, you think about last year, you know, in the Boston here, they had Boston beat, you know, and then you, then you let James Harden go get wings in Vegas and let him go to strip clubs. And, you know, I think, I think, I hope Doc has, uh, has really taken in and said, Hey, look, you know what? I may have to tighten the rings a little bit on my star players. Maybe I'm giving them too much freedom. You know, after this Philadelphia experiment, you know, maybe I need to back off a little bit and start putting these, holding these players a little bit more accountable. And, you know, so now you're looking at Giannis, who now uh, is starting to talk more than we've ever heard him talk about anything. Like, he's involved in everything. Now, he wants to be involved in the coach search. He wanted to be involved in, you know, with players being shipped out. Like, he's being more actively involved and then he made the comment, like, I don't know if I'm going to sign my extension yet. You know, I may go to Chicago. Chicago's a nice city. Like, when did you ever hear Giannis talking? Like, in a, in a, right. in a, in a, like, kind of like a, a normal NBA, you know, uh, personality, you know, like, you know, like a star player making demands, you know, with little pot shots in the media. He's never been that way. And now he's starting to get that way. Like, he checked himself. He got checked out of the game. They showed a video with him and uh, Adrian Griffin. This is when they said he kind of lost the team. He checks Giannis out. Giannis is talking to him, saying, I guess they're pointing, saying some, some over here, rotation, whatever. And then Giannis says, no, I'm going back in. And then he walked back in, and then Adrian Griffin, like, looked there and like, oh, okay. Um, all right, come, come back out. Pat Connaughton, whoever he is sub for. And you can't let a player do you like that. That, that to me, is a player, I don't care what kind of stature he is, it's showing you up as a coach. And it's be it's belittling you as a as a human being because he has he's showing you no respect by doing that. And you have to you have same thing with Darvin Ham and LeBron. LeBron did that the other night, checked his call. I mean, literally looked over the referee, raised his hand, time out over here, time out, checked himself out of the game, and then uh told uh told Darvin Ham, yeah, I'm gonna sit down the rest of the game. I was like, wow. Yes. Yeah, Stacey, that that was where I was gonna go with with my next question. You know, the whole Giannis and Tedekumpo story has been almost a fairy tale. Matter of fact, Disney made a movie about it, yeah. about him and his brothers, you know, leaving, leaving Africa, going to Greece, selling you know, uh, jewelry, whatever, on the street to try to make ends meet. They made yeah. a movie out of it. And when Giannis came over, you know, the city of Milwaukee took him in. He would go to local restaurants. and They would cook for him. It was like a fairy tale. Now, as you said, he's turned into the normal NBA superstar trying to dictate everything. I heard a story today that during the interview process, Giannis was in the room with a legal pad and, and, and a pen and taking notes on all the candidates. And he said he didn't want Nick Nurse because Nick Nurse was the guy who built the wall in the 2019 playoffs and the Raptors beat the Bucks. I mean, that should be the reason why you would want him because the guy knows how to coach defense. Well, and Mark, again, you know, listen, I'm always going to be pro player. But at some point, you know, players coach and players play, coach, coach, front office does their job. Everybody has a role to do. You have to be the best at what you do before you can even think about going over here and telling somebody else what they do, what they need to do. Okay. Telling the coach how to coach. You run this play, do uh uh run this screen play, run this play. You know, it's like do your job. What is your job? Your job is to be a superstar. OK, your job is to be an MVP uh, in the votes every year. That's your job. Come out and play hard. And we're going to try to surround people with you. That's going to help you your job easier. But we need you to pass the ball more. We need you to be more conscious of passing the ball more, uh, especially when you got four guys on you and you're just going to try to lower your head and run straight to the rim. And that's why Toronto beat them. You know, Toronto, you know, they 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 really study. And when you get to the playoffs, 
it's a different game because people have a lot more time to study you as a, as an individual and as a team and come up with different sets to kind of slow you down. You're not going to stop a guy like that, but you can slow him down. Yeah. And Damian Lillard's not happy with the way he was being used. That was another reason they fired Adrian Griffin. You know, they gave up holiday and and picks and and Grayson Allen to bring in Lillard and they really weren't using him in, in a pick and roll with Giannis. Uh, he didn't feel like he was getting the shots that he normally was getting in Portland. It's kind of a mess up there right now. Well, and again, you know, you wonder what happened with Terry Stotts now. Yeah. And what, you know, he got, you know, he, he left really early in the, in the process and he's supposed to be an associate head coach. And plus he coached Damon Lillard. You don't know what that dynamic was. Maybe, maybe, you know, uh, Adrian Griffin felt early on that there were people behind them, behind the scenes doing things to get him out of there. You know, uh, you don't know, but it was very yeah. mysterious how Terry Stotts left, and it was a well respected in the NBA as a, a top assistant. He's coached, he's coached before as a head coach, so he knows. But and he coached Damon Lillard in Portland, so uh, that was really kind of shady circumstances that uh, the team never let us know what really happened. But at the same time, these players have to play, man. You know, this, all this trying to be LeBron and be general managers. All you gotta do is look at LeBron's team now. Look at LeBron's team. You know, they're they're nowhere close to being, you know, a team that can be a threat in the playoffs. Mark, they're they're not. LeBron's hurt now. He may not play tomorrow. You know, uh, the more games he misses, you know, the more the better chance the other teams have to beat them. So, you know, they're in a hot race right now. The Clippers, the Clippers might be the best team in the Western Conference. Right. Yeah, I watched them in that game yesterday. The Lakers hung in there without LeBron, but the Clippers with Kawhi Leonard playing at that high of a level. They're they're legit. They they could make a run in the West. Yeah, they got they got enough. They got enough uh, key pieces. You know, they got a little bit of everything. You know, they got size. They got length. They can pass. They can shoot. I mean, they can defend. You know, their young players have come along nicely. You know, Russell Westbrook has fit in a nice role in in uh, for the Clippers. He looks a thousand times better as a Clipper than he did as a Laker. Yeah. Hey, Stacy, the big man is back. How about Embiid scoring seventy? And Carl Anthony Towns scoring 62 on the same night. Yeah, I, I'm telling you right now, man, you got to foul out guarding those guys. You know, <laughs> you, can't, you can't let somebody get 70 on you, man. And that's the same thing I said with Donovan Mitchell last year when he got that 70 plus on us. Um, someone's got to take fouls. Someone's got to be prepared to foul them. Don't let him get those shots up. Make it difficult as you can on him. If he hits it, he hits it. But, you know, that kid is so talented. Embiid is so talented. You know, he's inside, outside. And when he wants to dominate, that's domination right there. Yeah, that's pure domination. When he wants to dominate and play like the best basketball player in the world, he's very capable of doing that. It's not one of those things, Mark, you got to you gotta wait. Oh, maybe, maybe, or pray. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe we'll get that game out of him now. You know, he's capable of doing it every night if he wanted to. How about Towns, though, in the fourth quarter? He's obviously running out of gas. He was two for 10 in the fourth quarter hunting shots, trying to get the 70. And then their coach, Chris Finch, ripped the whole team afterwards, saying they were immature, they're playing selfishly, <laughs> just looking to get Towns points instead of playing the game because they wound up losing to the Hornets that night. Well, and Anthony Edwards didn't have a good game. He was too busy, like, trying to get and and uh, trying to get uh, Cat off. You know, he was yeah. passing a lot of shots. Um, I don't know if it was immature. I think that's a strong word. You got to be very careful if you're a coach to use that kind of, you know, that kind of tone and text texture. You gotta, you gotta understand, man, these guys, they're playing hard. They had a team that was all getting off. They wanted to get him off. Like, Hey, he's, he's, he's hot. Find a hot man. There's been so many times where you can't have your cake and eat it too. One minute you want a guy to be a star player and score all the points. And another time you want him to be a facilitator. You want him to not take those shots. Those are bad shots. You can't have both. Hey, Whispers, uh, I know you're alone there in the studio. You see Christopher Walken walk, wandering around the building? Yeah, he's always here, but you guys left me alone. It's not that I enjoy your company anyhow, but being alone here with Whispers is like torture. I prefer to just be by myself. <laughs> you got any stories about being in Beverly Hills, where Stacy's at now? Yeah, I... I usually wasn't invited to parties, but I'd show up anyhow with my long coat in the heat with a couple of kittens in the pockets. It's what I did. And especially if 
it was one of those parties where they would hire a band like the Foo Fighters. That always <laughs> got me excited. And if I heard the music from even blocks away, I'd scale walls, I'd climb trees, and I'd get into that party. Of course, you can't have a party without Stacey King's hot sauce. Tell the folks how they can get a bottle for themselves. Well, that would be my other pockets. I always carried that into parties, and then I could stay. But if you need some to get into your next party, just go to gimmethehotsauce.com. That's G-I-M-M-E dot com. And use one of the codes and get yourself a free bottle. Walk and cue or walk and fire. All right, Chris, so you can go back to daydreaming or whatever you were doing. Uh, we're going we're gonna to take a quick time out, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little NFL. So remember also, you can get Stacy's uh, signature hot sauce in the Chicagoland area at your local Jewel Osco store. So we're coming back, NFL playoff talk, and what's up with the Bears? That's next on Gimme the Hot Sauce. We're back on Gimme the Hot Sauce. Stacy's in his palatial hotel in Beverly Hills, whispers in the Taracho Studios, and I'm in the Winfield Public Library or something like that. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the NFL playoff, Stacy. What, what did you think about last weekend's results? Well, I thought Buffalo was coming in hot. Uh, I thought that they might be the team that could ride that little hot streak coming in because they got hot at the end of the year, won some big games. Um, I thought they had their shot. I thought they had a chance to to beat Kansas City. Um, you know, if Stephon Diggs makes that catch for that remarkable 63 right. yard bomb in the win that Josh Allen threw to him, he comes with that catch. It might be a totally different story, you know. Um, but, you know, Patrick Mahomes, man. Hey, Magic Mahomes, baby. He finds a way. He finds <laughs> a way. And then here, here's the interesting thing about Kansas City. Remember, they struggled like probably two or three weeks ago with trying to find other receivers instead of Kelsey. The guys were dropping passes. The receivers just sucked. All of a sudden, man, they look like all pros out there catching everything, everything. And then they're able to run the ball with Pacheco. Uh, their defense is solid. I mean, they're going to have their hands full of Lamar Jackson coming up. But I, I, yeah. I, just, I just think that, you know, because they've won so many games and they've, they've had these games on the road and they've never had to play a playoff game on the road. That was the first one. Uh, Patrick Mahomes handled it very, very well in hostile territory. I want to see Lamar Jackson get to the Super Bowl, but I just, man, as long as that dude Patrick Mahomes is still up and Kelsey's healthy, man, you can't bet against them. His sixth straight AFC championship game. Yeah. yeah. Pretty, pretty incredible. Hey, we almost had an all NFC North uh, championship game in the NFC. The Packers really had control of that game for three quarters. They kind of choked at the end. Oh, that was terrible, man. That was, they had a shot. They had a shot. And then he threw that bad interception at the end. Yeah. Throwing across yeah. his body where, as you know, in that situation, either you run it, get out of bounds, slide, whatever, throw it out of bounds, get rid of the ball. You cannot take a sack in that situation, and you cannot take an interception. Because I think they were only down three. So they were pushing the ball down the field to get a field goal, tie it up, or go right. for the win. And a young quarterback, after all the good things he's done, you know, for the last five or six weeks, in that moment, that is, I mean, that's one of those those moments where you say, you want to get away? You know, if you have a speaker, <laughs> you get away. He, that was a terrible throw, and if he could have it back, I guarantee you, Mark, he would take it back. And, uh, you know, just take what the defense gives you instead of, you know, being a, you know, what you call it, like a gunslinger, you know, just trying right. to make it happen. It's not there. Yeah, you look like Brett Favre throwing it across, deep across the middle late. I mean, Favre yeah. is known for throwing that kind of pick. I guess he looked at some of the old game films. And their rookie kicker missed a field goal in the fourth quarter. It would have put him up by seven. We probably would have gone to overtime otherwise. Yeah, I mean, again, sometimes those moments are too big for some players. You know, Buffalo kicker misses that field goal. Yeah, yeah. A chip shot. I mean, that's an easy field goal to make. You're at home, the crowd's on your side, and you blow you blow that field goal, you know, and um, – Wide right. I mean, that's yeah. – that Just like Scott Norwood. Scott yeah. Norwood. Norwood. Scott Norwood. Scott Norwood. 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 Somewhere, <laughs> hey, Scott Norwood somewhere there clapping. Thank God now that I'm off the, I'm off the hook now. It changed yeah, out their dartboard. Think. Now it's bass. <laughs> Hey, Stacey, you and I both picked uh, 49ers Ravens to uh, get to the Super Bowl, but I think the Lions have a shot this weekend. What do you think? Oh, man, they got, they got a puncher's chance because they can throw the ball. They can score in some different ways. They can run the ball. Uh, their defense is solid. Um, 
I hope Debo Samuels is back because if he's back, yeah. it takes their offense to another level. When he's not there, uh, Purdy's numbers are different. The running game is different. Um, and the passing game is different. So they got to get him back. I know he's got a, a hurt shoulder, and that's tough to play with Play play with because, you know, you're constantly getting hit on the shoulder being tackled. Um, but they're at home. Yeah. And being at home says something. Whispers, you think the Lions have a shot? Uh, they do, and uh, a lot of that has to do with any pressure they can get on Purdy because they have to disrupt his game. Everyone else is going to play the same. He's he's the the X factor. It'll be Hutchinson versus versus Purdy, in my opinion. Yeah, I remember in that uh, in that game against the Packers, he threw the ball right to the Green Bay safety Darnell Savage, and he dropped mm-hmm. it. Would have been a pick six. So Purdy, I, I think he's he's a good quarterback. But I don't know that he's certainly not in the class of some of these other guys. Well, he's great when it's flowing right, but you get pressure on him and it, it starts to fall apart. Uh, I tell you yeah. what, you know, people can say he's a system quarterback all you want to. He's still thrown for over 4,000 yards in year yeah. two. And he's got, you know, like the touchdown to, to turnover ratio is super low. Um, I don't think he'll win MVP. I think they'll probably give it to Lamar Jackson. Yeah. But I think he's very, he's very deserving as well. Well, speaking of quarterbacks, that takes us back here to Chicago. The big decision of the offseason, do you stick with Justin Fields or do you draft Caleb Williams? And a lot of national commentators seem to be advocating for the Bulls to, excuse me, the Bears to take Caleb Williams number one. Um, Stacey, I know where you stand, but do you, do you understand the argument for going with Williams? Yeah, the argument is that he's going to be cheaper. You know, yeah, so, right, right. And, and then basically it's just turned, you know, you're resetting your quarterback clock. OK, but the problem with that is, is that if your defense is going to be so far ahead and you're so close to turning the corner on every aspect of your football team, now you got to wait for your quarterback to develop two or three years to catch up with everybody else. When you already had a quarterback there that was already trending up and now you're a lot closer with fields, you know, winning the division in the next year or two and being a really, really, you know, really viable team to maybe play and go deep in the playoffs. But now, when all the other when your defense is good, your offensive line is going to be better, and then you get a quarterback, a rookie quarterback is going to have to grow and learn how to play in the NFL. He may be two years away from being where he's going to be, you know, and be in the same situation Justin Fields in. Yeah, and all of a sudden the North isn't as weak as people thought it might be. The Lions are are legitimate; they're going to be around for a while. And Green Bay looks to be better than people thought. So it's not like you can just say, "Well, we'll bring in." Caleb Williams and we're going to contend right away. I think they have a, a much better chance, you know, getting investing a, a number of draft picks to strengthen the roster around fields. Well, and you also got to look at like, you know, when, when, when has there been like a rookie that's come in and like, you know, really dominated at the quarterback position. I mean, Stroud was really good this year. He's been, he was, he was up and down early and then he got better at the end. Uh, Purdy, you know, Mr. Irrelevant. I mean, you know, he came in as a rookie and and played extremely well, but he was he was brought in to manage the team. You know, he's brought in to say, "Hey, look, here's what we need you to do. We need you to manage the team. Don't have turnovers. Get the ball to our playmakers and get out the way." I thought this year he had more command of the offense. I thought he looked like a quarterback that knew where he wanted to go with the football every single time. And so, if you're the Bears, that's what you're looking at, man. I mean, you know, Justin Fields gives you some kind of consistency at the position. Now, you're going to hire a new offensive coordinator, which you did. Now you got, they're going to go out and go get a quarterback coach. I mean, I don't know what the problem is. Why wouldn't you just let Fields play with this new offensive coordinator, work under a good quarterback's coach, and you, the tools are there. The guy's a, the guy's a you know, a dual threat to, to be court, at the quarterback position. And, you know, those are hard to find. And then, and then look at the percentage of busts for first picks as, at, at the quarterback position, number one. It is horrendous. Give me the numbers, Whispers. It's uh, worse than 50%. You can just go back and even on current players. I mean, even some of those guys out there, they're not great. I mean, look at Baker Mayfield. Um, you do have like a Matt Stafford who's been around a long time. But you go back even on some of these draft days. Uh, wasn't it Ryan Leaf over Peyton Manning? No, Manning was one. Was he Leaf one? Leaf was two. He was but two. even guys like Peyton Manning and Troy Aikman really struggled as rookies. So sure. you can't expect yeah. Caleb Williams to come in and set the league on fire. But you go no, to the big he, bus, though. You got uh, uh, Jamarcus. Uh, you got um, Russell. Yeah. Oh, there, there's a bunch uh, of them. 
And sometimes it takes a, sometimes it takes a quarterback to go to two to three different stops to finally realize how to play the quarterback position and get with the right coaches. Look at Geno Smith. Geno Smith in New York was horrible. You know, they they you know, oh bust, oh he was terrible. Da, da, da. Goes to Seattle, gets with Pete Carroll, his quarterback coach and offensive coordinator, and they make him into a stud. And that's the guy the Bears hired. Shane Waldron came from Seattle, where he helped uh, revitalize Geno Smith's career. He was also in Los Angeles working under Sean McVay when they drafted Jared Goff, helped in his development. So Waldron's been in a couple different places, has high marks around the league. He interviewed for a couple different OC jobs. And, you know, it's going to be his job to try to develop whatever young quarterback is under center next year. And I'm sure that during the interview process, Stacey, they must have given him some idea whether it was going to be Fields or Williams. Well, I'm sure I'm sure they're leaning there because he he – He's going to have a say so as well. There, I mean, he, no matter, I don't know how big of a say so, but he's going to have a say so because it's his system. He needs to find the best quarterback that can run his system. And I think the big question is, can Justin Fields run it? That's your first. Uh, that's your first question. Uh, whether you keep or not, we don't know. But just in case, can he run his system? You know, can Caleb Williams run this system? You know, um, those are the questions you're going to ask. But at the same time, you know. I, I'm just garnish as many picks as possible. Build your team that way. Keep your quarterback you got. It's not like he's a dog. It's not like he's like, you know, like um, uh, some some third round, fourth round quarterback that's not very good. I mean, the kid has shown you when he has, when you turn him loose and let him sling the ball all over the place, you know, he's a 300 plus a yard passer. You know, he can get the ball to the right people. Now, I think the biggest problem is, is that with him is, He's afraid to make mistakes. He's afraid to put the ball out there. If it's not 100% guaranteed that it's going to be a play that's going to be completed, he hesitates to make that throw. He doesn't want to throw interceptions. So, therefore, he's never going to take a risk, Mark, trying to hit a guy on a quick slant. He's never going to take a risk throwing the ball in the middle of traffic and say, tell my receiver to go get it. He's just not going to do that. He's not comfortable doing that. But in order to be a, an NFL quarterback, you got to get comfortable quick doing that stuff because that's that's that might be your only option, your only read to throw the ball to. And if you yeah, miss it, it that. <laughs> it's been interesting watching all these teams trying to maximize their coaching staffs, and it looks like Jim Harbaugh is going to have a second interview with the Los Angeles Chargers. So probably, I think he'll probably wind up taking that job. And Bill Belichick's interviewed twice in Atlanta. Did you guys see the thing on social media where where somebody? took a picture of Bill Belichick going up to the counter at, at Chick-fil-A and ordering a sandwich. Can you picture that? <laughs> the winningest coach in NFL history going, hey, can I get a number six? You know, and he probably told the, the girl at the counter, do your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, I mean, the Harbaugh hire would be huge for for uh, San Diego. I mean, you got all the pieces there. Already. You got a good defense. You got a good offense. You got a young quarterback that could be a stud. Uh, now you just got to just put all the pieces together. You know, what's, you know, look at what's been keeping them out of the playoffs is inconsistency, you know, losing yeah. games they should win, uh, not being mentally ready to play. They got a lot of talent across the board. I mean, at every position, they got talent. You know, you can't tell me that, that, uh, that the uh, Chargers can't be better than what they are. You get a good coach there, it's going to demand it. No telling how far they'll go in the playoffs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're just, they're just a solid team. They're a solid team. You got a stud quarterback, and and um, Herbert is a here. He's a stud, man. He, he's a stud. Um, you know, you got you know you got Mike Williams there. You got Keenan Keenan um, uh, Allen. Allen. I mean, you got some studs. You got uh, Eckler, the running back, who's a stud. I mean, you got it. And then you got Bosa on one side. You got you know you got uh, our guy who had the Bears, the Khalil the, Mack. Yeah, Khalil Mack, Khalil Mack. That was there. Yeah. I mean, you got a nice defense. You know, so yeah, you uh, can go roll the truck out, pay Harbaugh, say, "Hey, man, come out here, man." You know, your brother's going to the Super Bowl, probably going we'll to get you here in the AFC, and uh, let's try to get make us a Super Bowl contender. Well, the draft is still three months away. There'll be plenty of speculation about what the Bears are going to do in the weeks leading up to it. We'll uh, we'll have our guy Mark Brody back and some other NFL people to talk about what's the best course of action for the Bears as we continue on. Uh, we're going to take a break here, a little final timeout, talk about what we're watching on TV and uh, a couple other things. We come back on Give Me the Hot Sauce. Breaking news, Adam Schefter reports that Jim Harbaugh is leaving Michigan to accept the head coaching job at 
with the Los Angeles Chargers. I messed it up. <laughs> Dang. Damn. <laughs> I had one job and I messed it up. Yeah, one job. You're like a you're like a field goal. You're like a kicker. <laughs> oh man. Dang. And all that great all that great game. training at DePaul and you messed it yeah, up. I messed it. I, I still uh, need more experience. You sounded well, like Shefty Jr. there. I guess we got the breaking news. We were just talking about Jim Harbaugh and whether he might take the Los Angeles Chargers job. He indeed accepted it, according to ESPN's Adam Schefter. And it, as Stacy just talked about, it's a perfect situation for him to walk in. You know, he accomplished everything he wanted going back to his alma mater, winning a national championship. He's kind of flirted with the NFL the last couple of seasons. And now he's got the opportunity to maybe take the Chargers and, and, and get to a Super Bowl with that team. Yeah. Hey, Mark, I meant to ask you earlier, what do you think about them naming the parking garage after our new OC? Yeah, I didn't think he'd try to go with that stale joke after it fell flat earlier. <laughs> yeah, it fell, it fell <laughs> flat on the free. I want to see yeah. if I can catch you off guard there, Mark. <laughs> you're still, you're uh, still... hey, <laughs> hey, man, it didn't move the crowd the first time you said it. <laughs> you see what Mark did right there? He did a judo move and still threw me right under the bus. Wow. <laughs> but, but he was determined, Stacy, to try it anyway. Yeah. He got yeah. no reaction in the break, and he still did it anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, one, no, one even, no one even acknowledged it. We just kept talking about something else, and it was like – and he tried to bring it back. Wow. See, that, that's a true pro. He didn't go for it at all. Just, just judoed me and Whenever you have to explain a joke, it, it's not going to work. <laughs> for people that go to Bears games, there's a parking deck just south of the Soldier Field. It's the Waldron deck. And so Whispers, in his inimitable talent, tried to make it the Shane Waldron parking deck. That's right. Yeah. Good job, Whispers. Good job, Whispers. Good try, though, buddy. Hey, it, was, it was an almost. <laughs> good job. Good effort. Darn. Like that little kid, man. I'll have another hey, one in a minute. Awful. I got it off a popsicle stick, okay? Hey, Stacey, I just saw that the uh, the Bulls are practicing at UCLA. Uh, of course, uh, the home of Lonzo Ball and, and Zach Levine. You heard anything about Lonzo? I know they were supposed to get together with him during this trip. Some fashion. Um, yeah, he's here in L.A. I mean, so I know he was, they had planned to meet with him and have, you know, have some lunch with him, show, you know, talk to the guys and stuff. Um, you know, a little morale boost, let everybody know he's still around. Um, so I, th- I think that's still a go. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I got good reports that he has, you know, pain free. But that's well, not funny thing, thing is that now Kobe's doing a lot of the things that Lonzo was bringing to this team in terms of, you know, getting into the paint, setting up guys for open shots. He's even getting that look ahead pass. I'm not saying he's the same kind of player as Lonzo Ball, but if Lonzo does come back, it might be a situation where the best situation for him because Kobe's now established as their point guard. Well, you, I, I still think Kobe's a two, in my opinion. And I know he's playing point. He's doing a really good job um, because he's the best point guard we have on the roster. But I, I still think he's a two. I think he would even be unleashed even more in a scoring role. You know, if, you, if, you, if he's doing this at the point guard role, getting 24, 25, 30 at the point guard role, imagine if you take those responsibilities of out and say, hey, why don't you do what Zach and DeMar do? Go get buckets. I yeah. guarantee his scoring average would be, you know, 26 to 28 points a game as a two guard. And he's got size. See, Mark, it's not like you're moving a point guard and sliding him over and he's 6'1 or 6'2. You, know, you, right. slide, you slide him over at 6'5. And then your backcourt would be 6'6, six, 6'5 six, six, in a healthy Lonzo ball. That would be a deadly backcourt between those two with the size and they can rebound, they can defend. Kobe's done Kobe has done an excellent job running the point. But I honestly believe with the way he shoots the ball and you can run him off single double screens, and now you got a guy that could probably make him even a much more efficient score in Lonzo because Lonzo is a true point guard. There is no tweener. There is no he's a combo guard. He's a legit point. He makes everyone around him better, and he would make Kobe's game better. And you slide Kobe that two guard spot, I, I think he explodes. Yeah, and there's always the chance that Demar won't be back next year because his contract is up. Yeah, I mean there, there could be a lot of changes. You know, there could be a lot of changes at the end of the the season, depending on how they how they end up. You know, um, uh, it's evident that you know they you know Vooch is here. You know, he signed his contract, and Vooch is a big part of what they're doing. Whether you love or hate him, you know, the guy is a double-double machine. You know, uh, I, I wish he would have came up with that critical rebound uh, at the end yeah. of the game against Phoenix. He had like 50, he had 17 rebounds, and that's the one we needed to have right there. Of all the 17, we needed that rebound, and he didn't come up with it. 
And, um, you know, that ended up costing us the game. So, um, but, you know, like I said, you never know. This might be a totally different team next year. And if Lonzo, from what I hear, you know, can stay injury-free and run and jump on that knee and he's back, I mean, he'd be a great addition at the point guard spot moving Kobe to the two. Baseball was in uh, center stage yesterday with the announcement of the Hall of Fame class of 2024. And I think a lot of the news, Stacey, was more about the guys that didn't make it. Billy Wagner, who was a premier closer uh, with the Astros, came up just short. He was five votes short of making it. Gary Sheffield, 500 home runs, was in his last year of eligibility. He didn't make it. He, he came up short. Uh, guys like Andrew Jones didn't make it. You know, it, the Hall of Fame in baseball is so demanding to make it. You think sometimes the writers hold these guys to just standards that are unrealistic? Yeah, I do. I do. I think, um, you know, you look at a guy like Sheffield, Andrew Jones, who consistently gold glove outfielder, hitter, you know, a uh, big reason why Atlanta was so dominant during that time with Chipper Jones. Um, you know, you just, and, and I think Gary Sheffield, you know, admitting that he used some of that, that clear stuff that during the yeah. steroids, him admitting it and coming clean about it. I think that's hurt his chances. Yeah. And the three guys that did make it in case you didn't hear the news, of course, it was Adrian Beltre, third baseman. He got like 95% of the vote. He played 20 years in the major leagues. Todd Helton, who originally was the starting quarterback at Tennessee ahead of Peyton Manning and then chose baseball and then had a fantastic career with the Colorado Rockies. And who am I forgetting? Who was the third guy? Help me out guys. Um, oh, Joe Maurer, the catcher Maurer. with the uh, Minnesota twins. He got, he got close to 85%. So he was an easy choice. Uh, first year elected to the hall of fame. So, you know, always interesting to see which guys are going to, are going to be uh, in the hall of fame. And, and Jim Leland was named by the veterans committee, longtime manager, very well-deserving. Hey, a couple of uh, our favorite shows wrapped up this week. Uh, I was kind of disappointed. Both Fargo and Reacher only went eight episodes this year. So they both wound up. I don't know if you guys are watching Fargo, but that came to a kind of a disappointing ending for me. And then we were talking in the break about Reacher, which is a fantastic show, but we didn't get, you know, a totally satisfying ending there either. What'd you guys think? Yeah, I, I was disappointed in Reacher. I, I was like, <clears throat> I was expecting fireworks at the end, you know, because um, it almost seemed like this season was rushed. Like they really rushed it, you know. Um, you didn't really get to see some of the storylines develop like you thought they would. Um you know, like, like his, his whole crew getting, you know, kidnapped and murdered and all this stuff. And he, you know, you would like to know a little bit more about his, 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 uh, crew, you know, when he was in the right. military, you know, I think they rushed it. It wasn't as good as the first season. Yeah. They never found the one guy that was still missing at the end. It's, it's, it was kind of just left out there. Where, where was he? Apparently. Yeah. Dead, but, yeah. Let down. Yeah. They, it, it was, it's, uh yeah, and then I, you know what, Mark? I got a chance to start watching the True Detective. Uh, oh Joe yeah, it's pretty, pretty good, creepy, man. That's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, it's creepy, dude. It's creepy. That's, that's creepy. All those frozen bodies and <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, what the what the hell is going on here? Jody Jody Foster, you know, Jody Foster hardly ever does. I you don't ever see her doing these sex scenes. So when she had a sex scene and it was kind of cringy, I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> that, that was, was uncomfortable. Me. You're right about that. Yeah, it was because you never see her in a sex scene ever. And then you saw her with that old man and the guys, <laughs> he was in there with her. And I was just like, oh, oh. You know what else is uncomfortable? Those uh, frozen dudes starting to thaw out and we're seeing some shrinkage with those naked bodies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Nate, Mark, major shrinkage. That's the yeah. first thing I thought about. I was like, I was like, man, they might want to put some towels on these dudes, man, because when they thought, yeah. those people would be like, looking like little peanut and peanut shells. <laughs> just an egg and a bird's nest. <laughs> See that they could have thrown some towels over him. That adds nothing to the story, you know. Oh man, oh, oh I was yeah. thinking of George Costanza on Seinfeld. Remember the shrinkage episode? Yep, yep, yep. He went swimming and his girlfriend saw him. You know, that's what I was thinking when I was watching that episode. <laughs> <laughs> I just started watching it on the road since we've been on this road trip. And uh, you know, the because I got on I got on it like it started it like in the middle or something. And the first scene, she, you know, she goes to this guy's house in dead of winter. It's like, it's like super cold there. And uh, so, so she goes into this house and all of a sudden you, you, it pans away and then all you come back and you see the furniture moving 
and it's Jody Foster getting <laughs> pounded. And I'm like, Ugh. Ugh. I mean, any other, any other, I would have been like, oh, that's nice. Okay, I like that. But then it's like, it's Jody Foster's like, draw, draw the line of Jody Foster. Yeah, draw the Yankee line. Sweetheart. Yeah. yeah no, nah, too bad. No, nah, but there's a show on. Um, there's a show I just started watching on Xbox. I'm not Xbox, but on uh, Netflix. Uh, <laughs> Fool me once. What is it? What is it called, Tim? Fool me once. Fool me once. And from the very get go, it's it's captivating. It's great. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's it's like it's it's a story about. I, I don't really give out the story, but uh, there's a there's a woman. She's in the a military. The British. I think she's British military, right, Tim? Right, right. She's a helicopter pilot. The combat, helicopter. combat helicopter. Yeah, hell, yeah, combat. Something happened. She got PTSD. You know, flashes of PTSD here and there. Her husband gets shot. And she and her husband's from a wealthy family, like aristocratic Extremely family. Wealthy. And so he gets killed in front of her. They have a funeral. They don't know who killed him. They don't have any motives or anything. And then her he sister comes was back. killed though months before that. Yeah, her sister was together. killed months before. Him. And then all of a sudden he reappears on a baby camera. So like she she had a uh nanny she had a cam. nanny had a nanny cam set up. And I think everybody's involved, Tim. Oh, and, yeah, they're all playing a part. Yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> the girl, the girl who set up the nanny cam, their friend, she seems like she's involved too. They're, they're, they're all getting paid off. It, it seems that way. And then the, uh, um, well, one, she's hot, which is. Yeah, uh, she makes is. It, makes she it is. nice to watch. But uh, Yeah, she is. Um, did she you is. recognize the uh, house at all for the, uh, that the matriarch is living in? No. What is that? So I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, I know this house. And then she's walking around there and they go to the library. I'm like, oh, it's the Peaky Blinders house. I, you know what? I thought it was a oh, Peaky wow. Blinders house. Yeah, it's the same place. I thought it was a Peaky <laughs> Blinders house. But they it changed was the artwork color. and stuff. Yeah, they changed some colors and some furniture. Yeah, but... I swear to God, I thought it was a Peaky. I said, man, it was like the Peaky Blinders uh, house when he uh, when they moved into that mansion at the end. Right, right. That's it. And it was, and I think because because he was set like because he was set off from the road, and that set off from the road. That's why I said, oh, this is like the Peaky Blinders thing, but it was a different color. So I was like, nah, maybe not. Yep. Wow, Netflix trying to stretch those dollars a little bit, trying to save money on that production <laughs> cost. <laughs> you got to check Whispers. it out. I uh, will. Whispers, you got anything for the folks? It was the same thing. Fool me once. Uh, he, when he put it up there, he had both our names on there. It's uh, it's great. Highly recommend it. I have to check that out. Before we get out of here, Stacy, people are traveling, uh, trying to make sure they stay safe with their transportation needs. How about a uh, little plug for our good folks at Windy City Limousine? Oh, okay. Let me get my read out. Hold on. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves while Stacy uh, dials that up. Here we go. All right, I got it. Windy City Limousine provides a championship service. Making a reservation is so easy as a slam dunk. Let Windy City break the full court pressure of traffic and get you to your destination in style and on time. Contact Windy at 847-916-9300. That's 847-916-9300. Or head to windycitylimos.com. All right. Tell them Stacy King sent you. Uh, tell them, yeah, Michael... tell them, yeah, you might not get a discount, but they might just they might laugh at you and say, Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> Is Mike gonna be there to, to fetch your bags when you get back from the West Coast? Man, Mike's still out, man. I, I got my man Brian Hennigan, man. You know what? I left my glasses in his car, right? Really, this this uh, this tell you how Windy City is so great, man. So I'm getting out. He take me to the airport the other day. I I leave my my glasses fall out of my computer bag, and I need these glasses because like we're sitting up high in the Lakerland, so I gotta I'm up in the top, so I gotta have my glasses. So I get to I get to Phoenix, and he calls me. He says, "Hey, Stacy, did you leave your glasses in my car?" I'm like, "No, no, which one?" And he goes, uh, it, it was an uh, awkward case. I go, oh, that's my reading glass. That's my real glasses. So he says, I'll, I'll send them out to you. <laughs> so he overnighted them. They were here in L.A. when I got here. Nice. That's the service you get when you get yeah. windows. Absolutely. That's great. He saved, he saved my ass. He saved my ass. I'd have <laughs> been up there like, I'd have been up there, Mark, like like Mr. Magoo. I would have been able to see him. I'd have been out there calling everybody LeBron James. LeBron James, LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Stacy, uh, have fun out in Chino Hills tonight. Say hi to LeVar Ball for us. But try to get the big ball. I'm going to walk up to his house. I'm going I'm I'm to be like a stalker, you know, because me and, <laughs> me and LeVar hit it off when he came on the show, so I'm sure he'll let me come in. 
Yeah, yeah. Tell Mark we're still on our shoes. Waiting for those. Hey, yeah. are, are we going to be together in studio next week, or what's going on? Yeah, we're coming. Right. I'll be back Thursday. All right, cool. Well, we'll look forward to that. Hope everybody enjoyed this uh, remote episode of the Three Amigos. And until next time, Stacy. Drive home safely, PB.